If you observe the people around you, you'll find most individuals follow a formula that has been subtly or not so subtly taught to them by their schools, their company, their parents, or society. That is, if you work hard, you will become successful. And once you become successful, then you'll be happy. This pattern of belief explains what most often motivates us in life. We think, if I can just get that raise or hit that next sales target, I'll be happy. If I can just get that next good grade, I'll be happy. If I lose that five pounds, I'll be happy. And so on. Success first, happiness second. The only problem is that this formula is broken. If success causes happiness, then every employee who gets a promotion, every student who receives an acceptance letter, everyone who has ever accomplished a goal of any kind should be happy. But with each victory, our goalposts of success keep getting pushed further and further out so that happiness gets pushed over the horizon. Even more important, the formula is broken because it is backward. More than a decade of groundbreaking research in the fields of positive psychology and neuroscience has proven in no uncertain terms that the relationship between success and happiness works the other way around. Thanks to this cutting edge science, we now know that happiness is the precursor to success, not merely the result. And that happiness and optimism actually fuel performance and achievement, giving us the competitive edge waiting to be happy limits our brain's potential for success. Whereas cultivating positive brains makes us more motivated, efficient, resilient, creative, and productive, which drives performance upward. This discovery has been confirmed by thousands of scientific studies. I applied to Harvard on a dare. I was raised in Waco, Texas, and never really expected to leave. Even as I was applying to Harvard, I was setting down roots and training to be a local volunteer firefighter. For me, Harvard was a place from the movies, the place mothers joke about their kids going to when they grow up. The chances of actually getting in were infinitesimally small. I told myself I'd be happy just to tell my kids someday, offhandedly at dinner, that I had even applied to Harvard. I imagined my imaginary children being quite impressed. When I unexpectedly got accepted, I felt thrilled and humbled by the privilege. I wanted to do the opportunity justice. So I went to Harvard and I stayed for the next 12 years. When I left Waco, I had been out of Texas four times and never out of the country. Though Texans consider anything out of Texas foreign travel. But as soon as I stepped out of the T in Cambridge and into Harvard Yard, I fell in love. So after getting my BA, I found a way to stay. I went to grad school, taught sections in 16 different courses, and then began delivering lectures. As I pursued my graduate studies, I also became a proctor, an officer of Harvard hired to live in residence with the undergraduates to help them navigate the difficult path to both academic success and happiness within the ivory tower. This effectively meant that I lived in a college dorm for a total of 12 years of my life not a fact I brought up on first dates. I tell you this for two reasons. First, because I saw Harvard as such a privilege, it fundamentally changed the way my brain processed my experience. I felt grateful for every moment, even in the midst of stress, exams, and blizzards, something else I had only seen in the movies. A comprehensive view of how thousands of other Harvard students advanced through the stresses and challenges of their college years. That's when I began noticing the patterns. Around the time that Harvard was founded, John Milton wrote in Paradise Lost, the mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell a hell of heaven. 300 years later, I observed this principle come to light. Many of my students saw Harvard as a privilege, but others quickly lost sight of that reality and focused only on the workload the competition, the stress. They fretted incessantly about their future, despite the fact that they were earning a degree that would open so many doors. They felt overwhelmed by every small setback, instead of energized by the possibilities in front of them. 
that after watching enough of those students struggle to make their way through, something dawned on me. Not only were these students the ones who seemed most susceptible to stress and depression, they were the ones whose grades and academic performance were suffering the most. Years later, in the fall of 2009, I was invited to go on a month-long speaking tour throughout Africa. During the trip, a CEO from South Africa named Salim took me to Soweto, a township just outside of Johannesburg that many inspiring people, including Nelson Mandela and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, have called their home. We visited a school next to a shanty town where there was no electricity and scarce running water. Only when I was in front of the children did it dawn on me that none of the stories I normally told in my talks would work. Sharing the research and experiences of privileged American college students and wealthy, powerful business leaders seemed inappropriate. So I tried to open a dialogue. Struggling for points of common experience, I asked in a very clearly tongue-in-cheek tone, who here likes to do schoolwork? I thought the seemingly universal distaste for schoolwork would bond us together. But to my shock, 95% of the children raised their hands and started smiling genuinely and enthusiastically. Afterward, I jokingly asked Salim why the children of Soweto were so weird. They see their schoolwork as a privilege, he replied, one that many of their parents did not have. When I returned to Harvard two weeks later, I saw students complaining about the very thing the Soweto students saw as a privilege. I started to realize just how much our interpretation of reality changes our experience of that reality. The students were so focused on stress and the pressure, the ones who saw learning as a chore, were missing out on all the opportunities right in front of them. But those who saw attending Harvard as a privilege seemed to shine even brighter. Almost unconsciously at first, and then with ever-increasing interest, I became fascinated with what caused those high-potential individuals to develop a positive mindset to excel, especially in such a competitive environment. And likewise, what caused those who succumb to the pressure to fail or stay stuck in a negative or neutral position? For me, Harvard remains a magical place, even after 12 years. When I invite friends from Texas to visit, they claim that eating in the freshman dining hall is like being at Hogwarts, Harry Potter's fantastical school of magic. Add in the other beautiful buildings, the university's abundant resources, and the seemingly endless opportunities it offers. And my friends often end up asking, why would you waste your time studying happiness at Harvard? Seriously, what does a Harvard student possibly have to be unhappy about? In Milton's time, Harvard had a motto that reflected the school's religious roots, Veritas Christo et Ecclesia, Truth for Christ and the Church. For many years now, that motto has been truncated to a single word, Veritas, or just truth. There are many truths at Harvard, and one of them is that despite all of its magnificent facilities, a wonderful faculty, and a student body made up of some of America's and the world's best and brightest, it is home to many chronically unhappy young men and women. In 2004, for example, a Harvard Crimson poll found that as many as four in five Harvard students suffer from depression at least once during the school year, and nearly half of all students suffer from depression so debilitating they can't function. This unhappiness epidemic is not unique to Harvard. A conference board survey released in January of 2010 found that only 45% of workers surveyed were happy at their jobs, the lowest in 22 years of polling. Depression rates today are 10 times higher than they were in 1960. Every year, the age threshold of unhappiness sinks lower, not just at the universities, but across the nation. 50 years ago, the mean onset age of depression was 29 and a half years of age. Today, it is almost exactly half that. 14 and a half years old. My friends wanted to know, why study happiness at Harvard? The question I asked in response was, why not start there? So I set out to find the students, those one in five who were truly flourishing, the individuals who were above the curve in terms of their happiness, performance, achievement, productivity, humor, energy, or resilience, to see what exactly was giving them such an advantage over their peers. 
What was it that allowed these people to escape the gravitational pull of the norm? Could patterns be teased out of their lives and experience to help others in all walks of life to be more successful in an increasingly stressful and negative world? As it turns out, they could. Scientific discovery is a lot about timing and luck. I serendipitously found three mentors, Harvard professors Phil Stone, Ellen Langer, and Tal Ben-Shahar, who happened to be at the vanguard of a brand new field called positive psychology. Breaking with traditional psychology's focus on what makes people unhappy and how they can return to normal, these three were applying the same scientific rigor to what makes people thrive and excel. The very same questions I wanted to answer. Imagine in your mind a graph with a series of a hundred dots that all follow exactly on a line in a curve upward. All the dots fit on that line, except for one weird dot that's way above the curve. That graph may seem boring to you, but that graph is the very reason I wake up and get excited every morning. Clearly, I live a very exciting life. It is also the basis of the research underlying this book. This graph that I describe is a scatterplot diagram. Each dot on a graph like that represents an individual, and each axis represents some variable. This particular graph could be plotting anything, weight in relationship to height, sleep in relationship to energy, happiness in relationship to success, and so on. If we got this data back as researchers, we would be thrilled, because very clearly there is a trend going on here, and that means we can get published, which in the academic world is all that really matters. The fact that there is that one weird dot, what we call an outlier, up above the curve, is no problem. It's no problem because we can just delete it. We can delete it because it's clearly a measurement error. And we know that it's an error because it's screwing up our data. One of the very first things students in intro psychology, statistics, or economics courses learn is how to clean up their data. If you are interested in observing the general trend of what you're researching, then outliers mess up your findings. That's why there exists countless formulas and statistics packages to help enterprising researchers eliminate these problems. And to be clear, this is not cheating. These are statistically valid procedures, if, that is, one is interested only in the general trend. I am not. The typical approach to understanding human behavior has always been to look for the average behavior or outcome. But in my view, this misguided approach has created what I call the cult of the average in the behavioral sciences. If someone asks a question such as, how fast can a child learn how to read in a classroom? Science changes that question to, how fast does the average child learn how to read in a classroom? We then ignore the children who read faster or slower and tailor the classroom towards the average child. That's the first mistake traditional psychology makes. If we study what is merely average, we will remain merely average. Conventional psychology consciously ignores outliers because they don't fit the pattern. I've sought to do the opposite. Instead of deleting these outliers, I want to learn from them. There are psychology researchers out there who don't just study what is average. They tend to focus on those who fall only on one side of the average, below it. This is the second mistake traditional psychology makes. Of course, the people who fall below normal are the ones who tend to need the most help, to be relieved of depression or alcohol abuse or chronic stress. As a result, psychologists understandably have spent considerable effort studying how they can help these people recover and get back to normal. Valuable as such work is, it still only yields half the picture. You can eliminate depression without making someone happy. You can cure anxiety without teaching someone optimism. You can return someone to work without improving their job performance. If all you strive for is diminishing the bad, you will only attain the average, and you'll miss out entirely on the opportunity to exceed the average. You can study gravity forever without learning how to fly. Extraordinarily, as late as 1998, 
There was a 17 to 1 negative to positive ratio of research in the field of psychology. In other words, for every one study about happiness and thriving, there were 17 studies on depression and disorder. This is very telling. As a society, we know very well how to be unwell and miserable, and so little about how to thrive. A few years back, one event in particular really drove this home for me. I had been asked to speak at the Wellness Week at one of the most elite New England boarding schools. The topics to be discussed, Monday, eating disorders, Tuesday, depression, Wednesday, drugs and violence, Thursday, risky sex, and Friday, who knew? That's not a wellness week, that's a sickness week. This pattern of focusing on the negative pervades not only our research in schools, but our society. Turn on the news and the majority of airtime is spent on accidents, corruption, murders, and abuse. This focus on the negative tricks our brains into believing that this sorry ratio is reality. That most of our life is negative. Ever heard of the medical school syndrome? In the first year of medical school, as students listen to all these diseases and symptoms that can befall a person, many aspiring doctors become suddenly convinced that they have come down with all of them. A few years ago, my brother-in-law called me from Yale Medical School and told me that he had leprosy, which even at Yale is extremely rare. But I had no idea how to console him because he had just gotten over a week of menopause and was very sensitive. The point is, as we will see throughout what we spend our time and mental energy focusing on can indeed become our reality. It is not healthy nor scientifically responsible only to study the negative half of human experience. In 1998, Martin Seligman, then president of the American Psychological Association, announced that it was finally time to shift the traditional approach to psychology and start to focus more on the positive side of the curve. That we need to study what works, not just what is broken. Thus, positive psychology was born. In 2006, Dr. Tal Ben Shahar asked if I would serve as the head teaching fellow to help design and teach a course called Positive Psychology. Tal was not yet internationally well known. His best selling book, Happier, wouldn't be published until the following spring. Under the circumstances, we thought we'd be lucky to lure in a hundred undergraduates brave enough to risk a hit on their transcripts by foregoing a credit in, say, advanced economic theory for one in happiness. When we walked into the classroom that very first day, nearly a thousand undergraduates were packed into the auditorium waiting for us. That's one in every seven students at one of the most hard driving universities in the world. We quickly began to realize that these students were there because they were hungry. They were starving to be happier, not just sometime in the future, but in the present. And they were there because despite all the advantages they enjoyed, they still felt unfulfilled. Take a moment to imagine one of these students. By age one, many were lying in their cribs wearing a onesie saying, bound for Harvard, or maybe a cute little Yale hat in case something terrible happened. Since they were in pre-pre-kindergarten, which in some cases they were enrolled in even before being conceived, they were in the top 1% of their class, and then the top 1% of those who took standardized testing along the way. They won awards, they broke records. This kind of high achievement was not just encouraged, it was expected. I know one Harvard student whose mother would keep every handwriting exercise and restaurant placemat drawing he ever did, because this is going to be in a museum someday, she would say. That was a lot of pressure on me, Mom. And then they get into Harvard, walk confidently into that Hogwarts-like freshman dining hall on the first day of college, and have a terrible realization. 50% of them are suddenly below average. I like to tell my advisees, if my calculations are correct, 99% of Harvard students do not graduate in the top 1%. They don't find that joke very funny. With so much pressure to be great, it is no surprise to find that when these kids fall, they fall hard. To make matters worse, this pressure and the depression that follows pulls people inward, away from their friends, families, and social supports at a time when they need the support the most. They skip meals, shut themselves in their rooms or in the library, 
emerging only for the occasional kegger. And then in an attempt to blow off steam, they get too drunk to even enjoy themselves, or at least remember enjoying themselves. They even seem too busy, too preoccupied, and too stressed to reach out for love. Based on my study of Harvard undergraduates, the average number of romantic relationships over four years is less than one. The average number of sexual partners, if you're curious, is 0.5 per student. I have no idea what 0.5 sexual partners means, but it sounds like the scientific equivalent of second base. In my survey, I found that among these brilliant Harvard students, 24% are unaware that they are currently involved in any romantic relationship. What was going on here was that like so many people in contemporary society, along the way to gaining their superb educations and their shiny opportunities, they had absorbed the wrong lessons. They had mastered formulas and calculus and chemistry. They had read great books and learned world history and become fluent in foreign languages. But they had never formally been taught how to maximize their brain's potential or how to find meaning and happiness. Armed with iPhones and personal digital assistants, they had multitasked their way through a storm of resume building experiences, often at the expense of actual ones. In their pursuit of high achievement, they had isolated themselves from their peers and loved ones and thus compromised the very support systems they so ardently needed. Repeatedly, I noticed these patterns in my own students, who often broke down under the tyranny of expectations we place on ourselves and those around us. Brilliant people sometimes do the most unintelligent thing possible. In the midst of stress, rather than investing, these individuals divested from the greatest predictor of success and happiness, their social support network. Countless studies have found that social relationships are the best guarantee of heightened well-being and lowered stress, both an antidote for depression and a prescription for high performance. But instead, these students have somehow learned that when the going gets tough, the tough get going to an isolated cubicle in the library basement. These best and brightest willingly sacrificed happiness for success because, like so many of us, they've been taught that if you work hard, you will be successful. And only then, once you are successful, will you be happy. They have been taught that happiness is the reward you get when you become partner of an investment firm, win the Nobel Prize, or get elected to Congress. But in fact, as you will learn, new research in psychology and neuroscience shows that it works the other way around. We become more successful when we are happier and more positive. For example, Doctors put in a positive mood before making a diagnosis show almost three times more intelligence and creativity than doctors in a neutral state, and they make accurate diagnoses 19% faster. Optimistic salespeople outsell their pessimistic counterparts by 56%. Students primed to feel happy before taking math achievement tests far outperform their neutral peers. It turns out, that our brains are literally hardwired to perform at their best, not when they are negative or neutral, but when they are positive. Yet in today's world, we ironically sacrifice happiness for success only to lower our brain success rates. Our hard driving lives leave us feeling stressed and we feel swamped by the mounting pressure to succeed at any cost. The more I studied the research emerging from the field of positive psychology, the more I learned how wrongheaded we are not just the Harvard students, but all of us, in our beliefs about personal and professional fulfillment. Studies conclusively showed that the quickest way to high achievement is not a single-minded concentration on work, and that the best way to motivate employees is not to bark orders and foster a stress and fearful workforce. Instead, radical new research on happiness and optimism were turning both the academic and the corporate worlds upside down. I immediately saw an opportunity. I could test these ideas out on my students. I could design a study to see if these new ideas indeed explain why some students were thriving while others succumbed to stress and depression. By studying the patterns and habits of people above the curve, I could glean information about not just how to move us up to the average, but how to move the entire average up. Luckily, I was in a unique position to conduct this research. As a freshman proctor, I'd been blessed for a dozen years with an incredible up-close view of these students, what their habits are, what makes them tick, and what we can learn from their experiences to apply to our own lives. 
I've been able to read all the admissions files, see the admissions committee's comments, watch the students progress intellectually and socially, and see what jobs they received after college. I also ended up grading a large percentage of them in the classroom as a teaching fellow for 16 different courses. To get to know the students beyond just their exams and transcripts, I began meeting with my students in what I call my coffice, half coffee, half office, and Starbucks to hear their stories. By my calculation, I've sat for more than a half hour individually with over 1,100 Harvard students, enough caffeine to get an entire Olympic team disqualified for decades. I then took these observations and used them to design and conduct my own empirical survey of 1,600 high-achieving undergraduates, one of the largest studies on happiness ever performed on students at Harvard. At the same time, I continued to steep myself in the positive psychology research that was suddenly exploding out of my own institution and out of university laboratories around the world. The result? Surprising and exciting conclusions about what causes some to rise to the top and thrive in challenging environments, while others sink down and never become what they have in them to be. What I found, and what you're about to hear, was revealing, not just for Harvard, but for all of us in the working world. Once I had finished gathering and analyzing this massive amount of research, I was able to isolate seven specific, actionable, and proven patterns that predict success and achievement. Because positive brains have a biological advantage over brains that are neutral or negative, this principle teaches us how to retrain our brains to capitalize on positivity and improve our productivity and performance. How we experience the world and our ability to succeed within it constantly changes based upon our mindset. This principle teaches us how we can adjust our mindset, our fulcrum, in a way that gives us the power, the lever, to be more fulfilled and successful. The Tetris Effect When our brains get stuck in a pattern that focuses on stress, negativity, and failure, we set ourselves up to fail. This principle teaches us how to retrain our brains to spot patterns of possibility, so we can see, and seize, opportunity wherever we look. In the midst of defeat, stress, and crisis, our brains map different paths to help us cope. This principle is about finding the mental path that not only leads us up out of our failure or suffering, but teaches us to be happier and more successful because of it. When challenges loom and we get overwhelmed, our rational brains can get hijacked by emotions. This principle teaches us how to regain control by focusing first on the small, manageable goals, and then gradually expanding our circle to achieve bigger and bigger ones. The 22nd rule. Sustaining lasting change often feels impossible because our willpower is limited. And when willpower fails, we fall back on our old habits and succumb to the path of least resistance. This principle shows how, by making small energy adjustments, we can reroute the path of least resistance and replace bad habits with good ones. In the midst of challenges and stress, some people choose to hunker down and retreat within themselves. But the most successful people invest in their friends, peers, and family members to propel themselves forward. This principle teaches us how to invest more in one of our greatest predictors of success and excellence, our social support network. Together, these seven principles help Harvard students and later tens of thousands of people in the real world overcome obstacles, reverse bad habits, become more efficient and productive, make the most of opportunities, conquer their most ambitious goals, and reach their fullest potential. While I loved working with students, what I really wanted was to see if these same principles could also drive happiness and success in the real world. A month later, the global economy began to collapse. I suddenly began to feel nervous. How could I lecture to people on happiness research in a country that had just been devastated by the complete implosion of their financial system, not to mention one ruled by dictator Robert Mugabe? When I landed in the city of Harare, I was taken to dinner by some local business leaders. In the dim candlelight, one of them asked me, How many trillionaires do you know? I said jokingly, very few. He then said, Raise your hand if you were a trillionaire. Everyone sitting on the floor at the dinner table raised their hands. Seeing my shocked response, another person explained, Don't be impressed. The very last time I used a Zim dollar, I spent a trillion to buy a chocolate bar.
Zimbabwe had just been devastated by the complete collapse of its currency. All the financial institutions were struggling to survive. The country had even moved to a barter system for a while. In the midst of this, I worried that my research would fall on ears deafened by the concussions of repeated crisis. But to my surprise, I found people more eager than ever to hear about the research behind the principles. They wanted to bounce back from this challenge stronger than before, and they knew they needed a whole new set of tools to do so. While I've since found that my seven principles of positive psychology have extraordinary applications in the workplace, in both good times and bad, the economic collapse very quickly crystallized the need not just to help businesses and professionals preserve their well-being, but to help them to maximize their energy, productivity, and performance when they needed it the most. They recognized it too, for I suddenly found many once invincible businesses reaching out their hands for help. Within one year, I'd spoken to businesses in 40 countries across five continents and found that the same principles that predicted success at Harvard worked everywhere I went. For a boy from Waco who hadn't traveled much, it was a humbling experience to meet so many people across the world, each with a different story of happiness, hardship, and resilience. It was also a time of great learning. I learned more about happiness during my travels to Africa and the Middle East in the midst of a crisis than in 12 years of sheltered study. From Wall Street traders to Tanzanian school teachers to salespeople in Rome, they all could use the now crisis-tempered principles to propel themselves forward. In October 2008, I was brought into American Express to speak to a group of vice presidents. AIG had just become a ward of the Federal Reserve. Lehman Brothers had gone under. The Dow was at a record low. So when I walked into the room at American Express, the mood was grim. Tired-looking executives looked at me ashen-faced, and their blackberries, usually chirping incessantly at the start of these events, had fallen silent. Massive layoffs, leadership reorganization, and a decision to restructure into a bank had been announced 30 minutes before my 90-minute talk on happiness. This was not going to be a receptive audience, or so I thought. I assumed, just as I had in Zimbabwe, that the last thing a group of people so distraught and unnerved would be interested in hearing about was positive psychology. Yet again, it turned out to be one of the most engaged and receptive groups I've ever encountered. The 90 minutes turned into nearly three hours as executives canceled appointments and postponed meetings. Like the nearly thousand students who showed up for that first Harvard class on the subject, these highly sophisticated financiers were hungry to understand the new science of happiness and how it could bring them success in their jobs and careers. Then I began to branch out to people and companies in all other sectors who had been hit hard by the meltdown. These were not happy times, nor happy audiences. But regardless of their industry, company, or rank in the organization, rather than resistance, I found people almost universally open to learning how to use positive psychology to rethink the way they did their work. Meanwhile, positive psychology researchers had finished a meta-analysis, a study of nearly every scientific happiness study available, over 200 studies on 275,000 people worldwide. Their findings exactly match the principles I was teaching, that happiness leads to success in nearly every domain, including work, health, friendship, sociability, creativity, and energy. This encouraged me to apply the principles to other populations. Tax auditors, for instance, are not known for happiness. But if we're going to test the effectiveness of the happiness advantage in the working world, I wanted to see if teaching the seven principles could raise the happiness, well-being, and resilience of an accounting firm right before they went into the most stressful tax season in decades. So in December of 2008, I gave three hours of positive psychology training to 250 managers at KPMG. Then I returned to see if the training had helped inoculate these individuals against the negative effects of stress. Testing showed that the principals did just that, and in very short order. The group of auditors who had gone through the training reported significantly higher life satisfaction scores and lower stress scores than a control group who had not received the training. So it went at UBS, Credit Suisse, Morgan Stanley, and countless other beleaguered giants. 
In the midst of the largest downturn in modern memory, companies were instituting no-fly restrictions for their employees, similar to wartime when you think about it, tightening their belts, trying to survive. Yet they found room in their budgets for my trainings on this research. The leaders of these companies recognized that more than just technical skills would be required to help their company rise above the challenging circumstances. Soon law schools and law firms also began knocking at the door, understandably so. Researchers have discovered that lawyers have more than three times the depression rate of the average occupational group, and that law students suffer from dangerously elevated levels of mental distress. Several Harvard Law School students told me that they often studied at the smaller education school library because just being in the same room with other law students, even if no one said a word, spread negative stress like secondhand smoke. To attack this thorny reality, I taught the seven principles to focus groups of lawyers and law students across the country. We talked about how using a positive mindset could gain them a competitive edge, how building up their social support systems could eradicate anxiety, and how they could buffer themselves against the negativity that spread rapidly from one library cubicle to another. Again, the results were immediate and impressive. Even in the midst of their heavy workloads and tyranny of impossible expectations, these hard-driving individuals were able to use the happiness to reduce stress and achieve more in their academic and professional lives. Despite the academic explosion of positive psychology, its groundbreaking findings are still mostly a secret. When I started in graduate school, I was told that the average academic journal article is read by only seven people. This is an extraordinarily depressing statistic because I know that the number has to include the researcher's mom. That means we're down to about six people who read these studies. This is a travesty because scientists are making incredible discoveries daily to reveal how the human brain works best and how we can best relate to one another. And yet, only six people and one proud mom are privy to this information. The more I traveled, the more I found that the groundbreaking findings of positive psychology are still mostly unknown in the business and professional fields. Lawyers who suffer from unbearable stress are unaware that specific techniques have already been developed to buffer them against this occupational hazard. Teachers in inner city schools don't know about the study that isolated the top two patterns of successful teaching. Fortune 500 companies are still using incentive programs that were proven ineffective almost a generation ago. As a result, they miss an incredible opportunity to get ahead. If a study has proven how CEOs can become 15% more productive, or how managers can improve customer satisfaction by 42%, then I think the people in the trenches should know about it, and not just a handful of academics is to arm you with that research so that you will know exactly how you can use the principles of positive psychology to gain a competitive advantage in your career and in the workplace. Grounded in two decades of research that has revolutionized the field of psychology and further shaped by my own study of the science of happiness and success, the principles that form the core have also been field tested and refined through my work with everyone from global financiers to grade schoolers, surgeons to attorneys, accountants to UN ambassadors. In essence, they're a set of tools that anyone, no matter their profession or calling, can use to achieve more every day. The best part about them is that they don't only work in a business setting. They can help you overcome obstacles, reverse bad habits, become more efficient and productive, make the most of opportunities, and help you to conquer your most ambitious goals in life and in work. In essence, there are a set of seven tools you can use to achieve more every day. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe to our channel.